get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of Atari, Einstein Bagels, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Rise25 hosts in-person VIP events and masterminds for top entrepreneurs all over the country. Um, last year, this past year, we did events in Austin, Chicago, Santa Barbara, San Diego, New York, Sonoma, many more. We have not been to England yet. If you see the value of immersing yourself with other top entrepreneurs to connect and collaborate to get your business to the next level, go to rise25.com, contact us, and find out where our next event is going to be. It is my honor and pleasure today we have Dame Stephanie Shirley, known to business contacts as Steve because in a male-dominated business world, she would sign letters with her pen name. She'd get it in the door because she found that if she signed it with Stephanie, it would go in the trash possibly. So she started adopting Steve. She has an amazing book called Let It Go where it documents her life. It starts with her experience is an unaccompanied child refugee. Picture yourself at age five, what you were like at age five, and now, now go on a train away from your parents to a foreign city, a foreign country. What would you feel like? And that's what happened to her, and her parents wanted to protect her from perishing in the Holocaust. Her early experience of the glass ceiling at work because of gender discrimination encouraged her to set up her own business, which she did in 1962 with only, I believe, six pounds at the time. And she created one of UK's first software startups. Uh, she forged the path for not only women, but the whole computing industry. And while planning to start a family, she hit on the idea of offering part-time employment to professional women with dependents. Essentially... She had pioneered freelance-driven business and wanted to be woman-owned. That's why, you know, Dame Stephanie, I am still arguing Let It Go should be called Pioneered or something like that. But we'll, we'll get to that in a second. I Essentially, economy. this is my whole, like, argument for changing the title or, or the next book maybe be called Pioneered. Um, the, uh, the IT business prospered with a lot of hard work. In 1996, the company was floated on the London Stock Exchange, earning hundreds of millions of pounds, and it had employed 8,500 people. She made, I believe, 70 staff into millionaires. And this wealth has enabled her to devote her time and resources to giving something back to society. And she ranks among the world's leading philanthropists. And in 2013, she appeared on BBC Radio and actually discussed why she had given away more than $67 million of her, or pounds, sorry, 67 million pounds of her own personal wealth to different projects. And she supported strategic projects in the fields of autism. Her son Giles was autistic and IT, but her focus is purely on autism. And this is via the Shirley Foundation. They facilitate scientific research aimed to understand what autism is as opposed to what it looks like. Dame Stephanie, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much for inviting me. It seemed like, you know, when the company was growing and you were able to actually take money out, um, it wasn't to buy expensive cars or houses, it was really so that you can take care of Giles. Yes, um, vulnerable children can be extremely expensive. Uh, but both, in, both emotionally and financially, it's estimated that a, a child like Charles costs about 10 million in his lifetime. Wow. 10 million. And that was the, one of the few financial incentives that I ever had. I realized that I, if I was going to sort him out, um, I needed to do something like that. Um, they were difficult times. A lot of people ask, um, how I managed to build a business, which is a pretty full-time job, and at the same time rear a profoundly handicapped child. 
Um, and in fact, the two sort of balanced each other for, for many years. The only time I forgot my son Giles was when I was working. The only time I forget work, because I am a workaholic, was when I was with Giles. Mm. And that on for many, many years, very nicely balanced. Um, but eventually got on top of me and I had a good old fashioned nervous breakdown and um, Giles finished up in hospital and never came home, um, except that, yeah, that's a long story. Giles finished up in hospital. How did you How get... are you going to end What's that? <laughs> How are you going to end all this? <laughs> I mean, I love that. <laughs> this is, this is fantastic. <laughs> um, you know, the... I guess um, at the time, what did they have a good handle on what that, like what autism was? What were they thinking no. was going on at the time? At that time, it was thought to be a result, a, a psychological result of poor parenting. Really? And it, wow. Oh, yeah. That didn't help either. You know, the thought that the professionals thought you, you just didn't made this happen by not being, you know, especially when you were working, maybe being a mathematician isn't the best training for to be a parent. And you think, is it me? And uh, um, Nowadays, we do know that it is a brain disorder. Sure. And uh, one of the charities that I set up is, is doing nothing but research into autism, what it is. That I cannot believe that. So they actually said that to people at the time? Yeah. That it was, it's basically your fault. Yes. Wow. That's traumatizing in itself. Well, I mean, yes, it was pretty awful. <laughs> the, the term used, which I'm loath to repeat because it perpetuates it, we were called refrigerator mums. Wow. That we were too cold, you know, you think that. Oh, wow. Yeah, not nice. That's horrible. And so, you know, with him, um, what was working? As far as you said, you, you put them in to a separate facility, and that was trying also. Well, he went to school. Um, I got him into a primary school at the age of five, I think, and he stayed there. He should have come out at 11, but I couldn't find anywhere else for him. So he stayed there till he was about 13. And then I couldn't find any schooling for him whatsoever. So he stayed at home with me, and that was the route really to disaster um, and as I say he finished up in hospital and would have stayed there had not he begun to lose some of his human rights and um, triggered really by setting up the first charity because towards the end it so seemed Giles, like what's that Giles was the first resident in the first home of my first charity Right. It seemed, it seemed at the end. It, no, I said it seemed at the end that there was when you were set that up, it was it was helping. It was it was progress. Yes, it was. Was it progress? I think we felt you know there was nothing else we could do. We have to try this now. Um, it wasn't set up as a charity to begin with, because until you have three residents, you can't just make a charity of looking after your own son. Um, bad times. Yeah. Um, and so with the talk about the Shirley Foundation and what you're doing with the Shirley Foundation. My mission, and I'm quite clear about this, is to be pioneering, uh, never more of the same, no matter how worthy. And to be strategic, so it's not just helping this person or that group, but something that will actually um, have an impact long term on a whole sector. And so the big contracts they are. It's it's uh, the word I want. Social philanthropy, really, venture philanthropy. Um, so the first organisation, which started just with Giles, now looks after 143 people. 
um, and keeps an overview of another hundred, and that's today and it's growing. Um, it, the second one is the biggest one I've ever done, um, which is a school, um, which now employs 600 people, looking after 100 pupils, has a young adult center um, taking pupils from 19, students from 19 to 25, um, and that is of world renown now. Um, it, uh, I used to think the company would be my legacy, um, but that's not going to happen. It's changed its name. It's owned by somebody else. I, I no longer think of it as that's my legacy. But I do think of the school as going to be my legacy. It's a charity. I do expect it to be there in 100 years' time. And the third charity is Autistica, which um, funds medical research. And that is now 10 years old or something like that. And I'm enormously proud of it because that really is addressing some of the issues, getting people interested in research, getting people to contribute to research, because that has to be the long term good future. What's been some innovations? with Artistica or just the research in general? What have you found is, what's progressed? Uh, the typical of the study is, is um, work looking at uh, mental health in autism and why a large number of uh, people with autism commit suicide. Um, why um, people with autism die 14 years earlier on average than people without autism. Now, these are big questions that are real in the real world that make a difference to families. So it, it, we set up a, an autism brain bank, um, which is now mm. the largest brain bank in the world because the American one, something went wrong with it and it, it absolutely failed and it's useless now. Um, and um, people's brains are um, very, very valuable material to researchers. There's still things that you can only do post-mortem, uh, and they do tell you a lot about autism. Um, I started the looking at the economics of autism. That was in 1997, uh, and employed a university department to actually work out what is the cost of autism and I think I've mentioned it the cost to to a family is 10 million wow. um, the cost to, from the nation's point of view is now 32 billion a year and that's mainly in lost employment because if we could and we're working on this get people into employment even though they are autistic um, that would make a tremendous difference to the, that financial, $32 billion a year. Dame Stephanie, has anything interesting stick out to you that's come out of the Autism Brain Bank? I think it's all too technical for me. Yeah. I think that's, I, I don't know what they do with it. Yeah. It's been used for something like, what they say, a thousand experiments so far, um, which is, you know, the sort of measures that a philanthropist yeah does you know it is in use i also set up the autism sorry the oxford try again i also set up the oxford internet institute and that was a way of trying to give back to the sector from which my wealth stems um, some of the money and that now is of world renown um, i was on their advisory board for 10 years um, and it, it it's just great and i just bask in the reflected glory of some of the, the work that they, that they do there. Um, it's very good. I want to talk about just um, the future for a second. Um, you have a lot of wisdom in the business field and in innovating the research um, and the, the caring of autism. What, um, business-wise, um, as far as the, the future of technology, um, you know, you're talking to a you know founder of a a company. What things should they be thinking about uh, for the future? It has to be artificial intelligence. 
uh, the sort of robots that I was using in, in a factory production environment 50 years ago now means that we, we have uh, robots that can be colleagues, robots that can be um, the expert systems, they can deal with the um, annual reports, they, the, the whole administration of business is, is, is very largely going to be not just, will be, be done by robots. Um, I'm using a robot to teach um, autistic children and I don't design the thing or anything like that, but it's marvelous to see what a robot can do. Um, not just cheaper, um, not just better, but do things that people can't do. And that's the exciting way that it's moved on. Hmm. And then what should people be doing to help the future of autism? I should have known that you're going to ask this question. I mean, it shouldn't just be on your shoulders, right? I mean, you've done a lot. Oh. You've set up a lot of charities and foundations and, and research and care facilities. But, you know, if someone's listening, let's say their, their family member or child has autism, what should they be doing? The big, the big thing that I think people should be doing is learning to appreciate that autism is a different way of looking at the world. It's not just a disorder, a disease, all those names that we used to use, all those terms that we used to use 50 years ago. Um, but we now realize that people with autism see the world differently. They have different sensory systems. Their brains work differently. We can see that with some of the brain work that studies that's going on. And it then becomes a matter of diversity that people with autism should have the same or similar opportunities as you or I do, opportunities for education. My Giles was considered to be ineducable. Nobody tried to educate him. Um, that view of autism as just different, not a discrepancy, just different. Yeah. And that's what's going to make a lot of difference. Yeah. So I have one last question. This has been absolutely fantastic. I just want to thank you so much. Um, I have one last question, but before I ask it, I want to point people towards where they should find some of these resources online. I know they can go and let it go, get it on Amazon or Audible or wherever you can get the book, yeah. let it go. Where else should we point people towards online? The, we have a Steve Shirley website. Okay. Steve.com. SteveShirley.com. SteveShirley.com, okay. One word, SteveShirley.com. The National Autistic Society. Autistica. Autistica. Autistica.com Autistica also? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so we go to SteveShirley.com, Autistica.com. No, Autistica is uh, .co. Is that .org? .org. Yeah. .org, .org. Okay. okay. Well, look up Autistica and check it out. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, Check it out. I highly recommend everyone get and read or listen to the book. Let it go. It's it's fantastic. Um, it will There's change. Also, look at my TED talk. What's that? Have you seen my TED talk? Have you seen my TED oh yeah, talk? of course. Well, then we should tell people. To yeah, look at that. you can go to the TED talk on YouTube or uh, it's probably on your site too. Um, it's it's Wait not. It doesn't do the same justice though as the book, right? I mean, that's like thirteen no, minutes. But if, if you're lazy and you don't want to, you should read the whole, listen to the whole book, um, then you can watch the TED Talk, which is about 13 minutes. Um, Let me ask you, did, did you listen to it or did you read it? I listened to it. Interesting. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I if love wait, listening. There will be a film, Terry. There will be a film? There will be a film coming out. Yes. They're when, starting next year. Uh, they're starting next year. I don't know what it's going to be called yet. But um, looking forward to that. Okay, awesome. Then everyone, if you're listening, look out for the film as well. Do we know the name yet, or is it remains to be nope. no revealed? To be revealed. To be yeah. revealed. Okay, <laughs> name to be revealed. So, I always like to end with Inspired Insider with um, two questions, which is one: What's been a low point, and how you push through? And we've talked about a, a, a couple, and then what's been a proud moment? for you 
I think the low point I've already mentioned when I had a breakaway group, it really took me down um, into the depths. And the high point is again to do with people. Um, when I took the company into co-ownership, I was enormously thrilled about that. I don't think people realised how important it was, but I was thrilled. It had taken me a long time. Um, I still get on platforms and talk about my co-ownership, what we did. Um, and that certainly was a high point for me. Yeah. I want to be the first one to thank you, Dame Stephanie Shirley. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure and honor. So thank you very much. Lovely to meet you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.